um, John gave really fantastic coverage and, and commentary and context for the event today. So I will just add a little bit to that. Uh, I'm fond of referencing J.P. Barlow's 1996 Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. On the same day here in the United States that uh, we were passing and signing the Telecommunications Act of 1996, that's no coincidence, by the way, J.P. Barlow in Davos declared cyberspace to be a realm free of government interference, one where technology would simply route around efforts at censorship. I admire his optimism, but I don't think that's a fair assessment of the future that has emerged, and nor, frankly, do I think that internet reality would be better than the one we have today. But that doesn't mean we need to give a blank check to government regulation either. No matter your perspective on these conversations, whether you're a researcher, a government official, a civil society advocate, industry leader, I think we all want to reach an internet with better integrity, one that can sustain the delicate balances needed to preserve individual rights and freedoms with the greater social good. As we embark on this new era of interest in internet integrity, governments around the world, like so many others, are stepping up their game. Internet governance is a complex system with many different levers of power and we're at a moment now where governments are, are looking to pull theirs harder than they have in the past, for good reason, I would say. Fortunately, they're not working in a vacuum. Rather, they're drawing on expert input from a wide variety of stakeholders and incorporating these non-governmental perspectives into their processes in a wide variety of aspects. Now, we know how this collaboration works in legislative processes. We know lobbyists and advocates come in, they work with governments as they're developing laws and rules. It's not as clear how this collaboration works in the government sector outside of the process of passing legislation. And as we all know, with really delicate issues like this, the devil is in the details. It can be more important what happens after the law is passed than the discussions and the, and the settling of language and the law that goes in. That's where the various executive and independent agencies come in to turn these laws into reality on the ground. They too have well-developed mechanisms for collaboration with non-governmental stakeholders. And these mechanisms are very relevant to the issues of content and platform governance that we're talking about today. So I am delighted to welcome three public center representatives from different regions. The European Union, we have Ofcom in the United Kingdom, and we have the United States here to share their perspectives on improving internet governance and integrity, and in particular, how they engage with non-governmental stakeholders in the work that they do. That's enough for me talking. Let me let them introduce themselves and say hi, and then we'll get straight into questions for them to discuss. So we'll just go down the line in order here, if that's all right, Travis. Sure thing. Uh, hi, I'm Travis Hall. I am a team lead for internet policy at the National Telecommunication Information Administration, which is a part of the Department of Commerce. Uh, I have been at NTIA for a little over six years now, and um, relevant to this particular conversation, I actually got brought in through a multi-stakeholder process. I was, uh, prior to that, I was an academic working on uh, biometrics and identification technology. And in that role, I participated in the NTIA multi-stakeholder process on developing um, uh, best practices for uh, facial recognition, private and commercial use of facial recognition technology. Uh, and so I was brought in for that um, with a background primary, primarily in privacy, but have since uh, been a bit spread out onto a number of other issues, including uh, content and some degree internet governance. And I'm uh, gonna keep the intro short, but I would love to, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Hi, I'm Camilla Bustani. I'm director of the international team at Ofcom. Ofcom is the UK's communications regulator. It's independent from government, um, but we are accountable to parliament and we cover quite a large range of uh, sectors. So uh, telecoms, broadcasting regulation, spectrum management, postal regulation, and soon to be uh, online safety as well. The bill to empower us to be the online safety regulator was published last Thursday, and we're still digesting it. So looking forward to the next challenge. Good afternoon, my name is Peter Fatelnik. I'm working out of our offices of the European Union here in town in Washington, DC. And here I handle all the digital economy policy files. When I arrived four years ago, I thought that was maybe an easy task. But uh, the last four years have been pretty rough for me, as many of you know that in the European Union, we embarked on this twin transition, the green and digital transition, as obviously we realize as well that the internet 
and a well-functioning internet is core to making any of these societal and economic changes we we want to make, but we also have to make if we are frank. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you all. So let's start talking a little bit more about where you see multi-stakeholder convenings and spaces uh, working within within the world as you see it, the policy issues that you work on, and the kinds of changes you're trying to bring about. So I know that's a little high level, um, but we'll get into different pieces of this one at a time. I don't. What I don't want to do is focus on specific details or proposals like the online safety bill, section 230. I'm not going to ask you anything about section 230. That's not what today is about. Um, but I, I use that, please, as the general context, as you think about how you imagine the different people who will be speaking at this event after you and the other participants in the room, how can you see them most productively contributing to your work? And anyone who'd like to go first, it doesn't need to be by default, Travis is sitting on my left. Of course, he's welcome to. I'll go anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we, can, we can switch it up afterwards, but um, just to get the conversation started. Um, it's a great question, and I'll say um, first and foremost, you know, uh, one of NTIA's many hats that we have. We similarly have uh, quite a different, uh, quite a number of uh, of equities, although we are not a regulator, so we actually don't regulate any of these spaces. Um, uh, but one of the hats that we do uh, have is we are the U.S. government representative, the uh, two. Uh, I can uh, in terms of the government, uh, the, in terms of the GAC, right? So we we are actively involved in one of the primary multi-stakeholder processes um, that uh, that governs how um, the backbone of the internet functions, right? The DNS system functions, and uh, the United States government continues to be fully um, supportive of and fully engaged in that uh, in that conversation in in that process. Um, it's also a great example of like how hard these things are, right? Like it, how frustrating it is and how wonderful it would be if the policy answers were simple and somebody could just decide, right? Um, but, uh, but ICANN is one of those things that we can actually hold up as a real success in terms of the healthy functioning of the internet um, at its core and at its most basic. Um, we also uh, have engaged in multi-stakeholder pro pro um, processes on a range of different issues um, from uh, the, I think one of the very first ones was actually on intellectual property, even though people don't know about that one too much. Uh, we did three on privacy, one of which being the facial recognition one that I was involved in, um, ultimately actually ended up running both the facial recognition one and the one on um, privacy and drones. And then we did three on cybersecurity, um, the most recent of which is, I uh, was focused on developing a software bill of materials. Now, um, that's the range of things that NTIA does, but there's certainly a large number of things that happen under the federal government that could be probably linked, like tied into some of these conversations as well, such as, um, uh, you know, certifications of codes of conduct. Um, or, uh, or just simply a lot of like real hardcore stakeholder engagements. There's a lot of laws that, that govern how stakeholders can be engaged, um, be, uh, be it um, in terms of uh, advisory committees uh, or, um, or uh, rulemaking proceedings and things like that. But there really is kind of a, you know, from the beginning, a bit of um, an impetus on the federal government to engage with stakeholders. And, um, and that is key to, particularly with NTIA, key to what we do, right? Our power comes from our ability to engage with stakeholders to make progress on policy issues that are not necessarily regulatory. Um, and so uh, all of that being said, um, I think that that's a broad brush painting a lot of really, really different processes with really, really different laws and really, really different incentive structures together. And they are different and they are contextual. And I think that that's, that's part of the, the interesting, I think, fundamental question for maybe part of this discussion is in terms of whether, multi, whether these kind of multi-stakeholder processes, um, uh, at what point in time are they? You kind of like laid down after laws have been passed, but multi-stakeholder processes in part, like we have used them where laws have not really been there, right? Uh, to kind of fill some gaps to help get things to move forward and uh and there is kind of the question too of like is um what is ultimately the purpose uh you know in terms of an end goal how clearly is it defined is it a standing thing is it a is it a, a short-term thing there are lots of different um 
moving parts to having governments engage with stakeholders that fundamentally shapes the 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 outputs the quality and how that stakeholder process actually uh pulls through um such that uh you can kind of like you can kind of like talk a little bit about broad brush but but it's but it, the context really really matters thank you yeah there's a lot to draw out from that but i don't i don't want to go too far i want to make sure that camilla and peter have their chance to, to jump in on this thanks um so I guess I'll start by uh, remembering we are a telecoms broadcasting spectrum post regulator. Um, and digital is very, very different. So I think in, uh, in our traditional sectors, they are sectors. Digital is not a sector. Um, it's not like energy or transport or, or communications where you can sort of draw the boundaries of it. Um, there are no boundaries to it. Um, and so also digital is not a service or even a set of services. It's an open-ended list of an infinite number of services just provided digitally. So that's different too. Um, and digital is pervasive in a way that um, communications isn't pervasive. Um, you pick up the phone, you make a call. Um, energy isn't pervasive. You get home, you turn the heating on, um, but digital is. I often sort of joke that I wake up in the morning and I knock my head against Google when I take my phone and sort of look at what's going on in the world. And the last thing I do before I go to sleep is I'm knocking my head against Google again. Um, and, you know, the whole day I'm interacting with it as a as a consumer, as a citizen, as a professional, as a parent, as a patient, um, you know, as a campaigner, as anything. Um, and each of those interactions is different. Um, and I, I will have a number of them during the course of the day. So, so that is all very different. And that means that uh, as a regulator, we don't have all the knowledge or all the expertise. And you know, it would be foolish to think that we were equipped on day one, we're about to become the online safety regulator uh, to know not only all the answers, but all the questions that we need to ask, right? So, um, so it's absolutely crucial for us as a regulator to reach outside um, and, and bring in the expertise of all of the multi-stakeholder groups, of all the charities, the think tanks, the academics, um, the civil society organizations who have been looking at a number of the issues raised by um, the digital ecosystem and who could help fill in some of our gaps. Um, we, we do have some experience already of uh, the sort of multi-stakeholder engagement. We have, um, as Ofcom, a statutory duty to promote media literacy. This is something that's been in the law since the early 2000s and historically was associated with our role as a broadcasting regulator. But we've we've interpreted this this duty over the years as um, basically we've done a lot of research on user experiences with broadcasting, but also lately online. Um, and that's helped to kind of inform our thinking. Um, but we realize that now that we're about to become an online regulator, that uh, regulating for online is not just about regulating the supply. Um, it's very much about regulating or let's say paying attention to the demand. So making sure that users are informed and empowered. And so media literacy and digital literacy are really important uh, cornerstones of regulatory response to the challenges we face in the digital world. So we convened um, as part of our Making Sense of Media program, uh, a media literacy panel, um, which essentially brings together uh, hundreds of um, experts in media literacy, design, delivery, implementation, um, because we don't, we've never designed a media literacy intervention. Um, we don't have that expertise. Um, but there are hundreds of organizations in the UK that do. So we've brought them in and they're helping to show us uh, what media literacy can do, how one should design a media literacy intervention to have an impact, what the limits of media literacy interventions are and where you need another tool. Um, and that's been incredibly useful. It's a relatively new program, but it's, um, it's definitely the way of the future for us, I think, in terms of engaging um, stakeholders. So there's the expertise gap. There's also the fact that I mentioned, um, you know, it's pervasive, digital is pervasive. So any intervention that we might conceive of to address a particular problem 
will inevitably raise uh, you know, potentially unintended consequences somewhere else. Um, so it's really great to be able to, to, to call upon people who are paying attention to the, to the whole field um, and help us to be aware of things like human rights impacts or you know, potentially ossifying technology where that's not really our intention, but might, might be the consequence. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is you know, the example I gave um, about make, making sense of media as a national um, multi-stakeholder engagement, but uh, the digital space requires global multi-stakeholder engagements. The companies that we're talking about they operate across the world, they operate across borders. Um, and uh, you know, it doesn't actually make sense for us to, uh, to try to tackle them on our own at the national level. So we need a global multi-stakeholder dialogue too. And I'm, you know, I'm very, very pleased to be here and, and sort of start that dialogue for us. Thanks. Well, we're certainly pleased to have you, Camilla. Thank you. I'll draw out a couple more points from these things, but first, Peter, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add at this opening provocation? Since, since everybody is so, so happy with the stakeholder engagement, let me kind of try to drill a bit into a parts Wonderful. where maybe I should start by saying, obviously, a multi-stakeholder engagement and, and, and engaging with non-government stakeholders is very important. The European Union considers herself as the mother of doing this sort of stuff. But it's not the panacea for everything. That is also true. So I think in the process we run, we use it at the early stage and you have very well motivated why it is important to be at the early stage, because this, I think we consider these people as having the capacity to see around corners where we can't see, so they can do that. I would like to add one, which is at the very end, which has to do with enforcement or when legislation is already passed and is on the table. This is also to do with, with awareness, education, finding evidence, supporting enforcement, and uh, as every European Union regulation gets regularly reviewed, basically after adoption of a regulation is just before the revision. So, so there's also this whole process starts all over again. But in between, and this is where I want to be more critical, I think we have found that, that engaging with too many stakeholders at the process of drafting a legislation is maybe not a good thing. Uh, you know, this is like the, the many cooks in the kitchen. This is, you know, an, an author writes a book alone. You know, you may get a lot of ideas traveling the whole world, but then he sits down and writes the book, you know, kind of thing. Which, funny enough, in the European Union, we still have for most of the legislation actually only one pen holder, one person. You know, everybody's hammering on that person, obviously. But there's one person sitting down, kind of things are not so big that they can't hold in one brain. So that I think we found is quite useful and also see limitations of engaging with stakeholders. Thanks, Peter. Yes, that one rapporteur always has quite a lot on their shoulders with the 700 amendments or however many the Digital Services Act just processed in the, in the European Parliament. Um, a lot of really fascinating points. First of all, just thank you all again for being here and for sharing your experiences. I think it's so valuable to break through some of the false impression that um, multi-stakeholder engagement with government is the dramatic televised hearings or the secret lobbyists and closed doors and everything else. And it's really a much more rich tapestry than that. And there really are, I think, a lot of opportunities to engage and provide perspectives into these processes. Um, from Travis's comment, I, I'd like to call out this sort of separation of, a, of thinking about the process by which you bring multi-stakeholders in, these are not his words, as well as a, as a real focus on what the output of the multi-stakeholder process is. I think these are very separate considerations and particularly given the, the breadth and the diversity of multi-stakeholder processes as Travis was mentioning, it's important for us to, to think in the context of, of building new multi-stakeholder processes for coming content and governance regulations how we want to think about the process and what we want the outputs of these to be. Um, Camilla, I love your line, digital is different. It certainly is, the no boundaries, and it's going to be different for how we engage stakeholders as well. And um, uh, Peter, it's it's not a panacea. Oh, one more thing from Camilla. We can't even know the questions in advance. No one can know the questions in advance. It's, it's why we have multi-stakeholder processes in the first place, because those questions will arise not only from different individual perspectives, but from the combinations of perspectives that we can put together in processes such as this. Um, I'd like to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and Peter, um, your, your point about multi-stakeholderism not being a panacea for everything, absolutely correct. And very important to call out, I think, at this early stage of this conversation, it is not a panacea for everything. And we have to not let um, inclusion of these perspectives 
harm or hamper us from, from getting to decisions when we need to get to decisions and from getting to outputs when we need to. Um, I want to drill down a little bit more on a, on a specific example of a multi-stakeholder engagement that, that I'm very fond of. And this is not a perfect example by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it's a really very interesting one. So often we think about diverse inputs to government processes as a necessary step in policy development. But once the law's out there, we switch to this sort of arm's length model, right? This is, this is the sort of uh, theme of a, of a false understanding of this dynamic that I, I raised when I first was setting this, this conversation up. Um, I see a lot of experimentation developing in the space in how governments are approaching this. And in the European Union, we saw what I thought was a very interesting experimentation with the code of practice on disinformation. I worked at Mozilla at the time this was going on. My former policy team at Mozilla was engaged with the European Commission on this. Now the code of practice on disinformation for those not familiar with it was uh, uh, led by Commissioner Jourova and it was an exercise in sort of setting out uh, target points for a group of industry stakeholders and they were coming and going back and forth and back and forth with the commission. The commission was essentially saying, what can you do with your practices to help reduce the spread of disinformation. And there was this back and forth going through this. Um, the government in this function was serving as sort of like a partner and, and a sort of a conscience for an industry-led effort to go further and further in improving its practices to stop disinformation. I think this is an interesting experiment. I'd love to know what my fellow panelists here think about this sort of experiment, other experiments like that, sort of what kinds of experiments are you seeing? And, and conversely, are you worried that as we start to experiment with multi-stakeholder governance, we lose clarity for the stakeholders and how they can be part of this and how they can make their voices heard? Maybe I'll, I'll pick on I Peter first. The last few times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was going to pick on Peter first as our as our European Union representative here, who I'm I'm sure knows far more about the code of practice than than I do in this process. And I probably want to and. Uh, but but I, th I think you're right. It's it's a good example, and, and you have to put yourself in the shoes of, of Vera Jourova back in 2015. Kind of, she knew. I mean, she knew. Everybody sensed already at that point in time there are issues in, on disinformation. We knew that. Uh, I mean, there, there have been many political decisions which have already at that time been influenced by disinformation. And but what do you do? And that was absolutely unclear at that point in time. There was no precedent. We couldn't sort of go in another country and have a look, okay, what are you doing or how are you faring? Companies were very clear that there is no issue, none at all, zero, none. So, so I think if you don't know, well, then you, you just start somewhere because that's sort of the simplest implementation of a greedy algorithm. Just make one step which gets you in a better place. And, and I think with the, with the code of practice, we have started taking steps to get us in a better place. There was, or is still, quarterly reporting of KPIs by the companies participating. I mean, and of course the KPIs have improved and this is not that they were abysmal the first three months and slowly and then one company was pushing ahead another one was catching up. So you could see also a competition element. It was a very, very interesting experience to, to get agility into the companies to work on these issues. I think that's the greatest achievement of the code of practice. And then of course, by the time you say, well, maybe this is something we want to, bro to broaden. I mean, it covers right now a, a good dozen of, of platforms. In Europe, there are more than 10,000 online platforms active on the European single market. Maybe everybody else kind of needs to get up to speed sometimes. So it was, it was a fantastic experience, but glad to hear, I don't know what other people think. Thanks. Um, just on the uh, EU code, I know that um, certainly after the first phase, it got a mixed report card. And I think a lot of people thought, you see, this kind of uh, approach just doesn't work. It's just um, you get industry to write its own rules and it doesn't work. But actually, I think uh, anyone, anyone who knew what this was about would have been expecting a mixed report card. And I think it's a good thing that it was mixed because that just means that it exposed what was missing. And that's kind of the purpose of the exercise, right? So we learned from it. Uh, what kind of data do we actually need the platforms to be providing us in order to, for us, the commission, the regulators, to assess whether their commitments have had an impact? Um, you know, that's the kind of question that uh, we were able to ask ourselves after the first year of the code. So I expect that it'll continue to, to pose new questions with every iteration. Um, and I think that's the sort of the style of, of regulatory dialogue that we, we should expect. Um, 
to your question, Chris, um, I tr I'm trying to not think of it as an experiment, though, because I actually think it's a change of paradigm. And I think we need to think quite broadly about this. Um, you know, thinking, thinking to what you were saying earlier, I think when people think of the word regulation, they still think about, you know, someone in a gray suit, no offense to anyone here in a gray suit. <laughs> who you know sets a rule then uh, monitors compliance finds a breach slaps a fine slaps the wrist moves on next period etc on and on um, but that's not how this will be in digital because the technology changes so quickly the business models change so quickly that if you write a rule tomorrow or even today it will already be out of date so you need to have agile, continually changing live regulation. I think the code of disinformation is an example of that. Um, so you'll have a framework and a statute. So you'll have the DSA in Europe and you'll have the Online Safety Act eventually in the UK, but that's the framework. And behind that will be a number of things like in the UK's case, Ofcom is going to have to produce risk profiles, risk assessment guidelines, codes of practice. Um, and those are going to, you know, those are going to be live. So I think this is, this is new this is this is what the future is going to look like um and it's different from it's different from what we used to do in you know in telecoms for example you know there are only so many ways you can provide wholesale access to an alternative operator to the incumbents network and that's it right um but it's actually interesting because this this approach of uh like the coded information one thing about it which i think is really important is it's starting to show um, joint responsibility for delivering against outcomes. So it's not just the regulator writing rules, the, the stakeholders comply, it's some, the, the rules are being kind of jointly conceived. And that shared responsibility, I think is really important. And Ofcom, I say that it's different from telecoms, but funnily enough, Ofcom did a bit of an experiment itself a couple of years ago in the telecom space where uh, historically we have, we're responsible for regulating telcos in terms of the consumer protection aspects um, under the European framework, in fact. And it's fairly prescriptive. Um, and we found that uh, providers were complying with the fairly prescriptive rules, but they were developing new practices which might have been compliant with the prescriptive rules, but they weren't really compliant with the spirit of the rules. Um, and we thought, well, we could either write another rule um and keep doing that and sort of play catch up whack-a-mole or we could really just try to get them to just do the right thing so we decided to try that and we introduced what's called what we call the fairness framework which is basically a set of fairness principles and we invited the big telcos to publicly commit to these principles um and it was fascinating. Um, they were all a bit nervous at first, but in the end, they came up on a stage like this one and, uh, you know, signed on. Um, and we've been, we've been monitoring them against those fairness principles and publishing our reports. And it's a little bit of a sort of reputational um, effect as well. But I think that was the first, that was our sort of ginger steps towards this new approach, this new sort of paradigm shift into a, you know, sharing of responsibility with the people who are regulating for delivering against the policy outcomes that we're, that we're looking to, to deliver against. Um, I think I would just sort of say that uh, what this means is that we're expecting stakeholders not just to be focused on compliance. I think this is a big part of the paradigm shift. It's not just about compliance. I don't want to see compliance officers. I think compliance, it's about the spirit of the thing. It's got to run through the whole business. Um, but equally, regulators, implementation is not just going to be about enforcement. It's going to be about sustaining this ongoing learnings from the stakeholders, from the multi-stakeholder fora that we're engaging with, and, and keeping, keeping the rules and the guidance uh, up to date, alive, basically. And of course, there will be risks. Um, I think the risk that was perceived with the code of disinformation is this, this idea that you, you, you give platforms the right to write, write the rules and they'll write them in such a way that causes minimum, you know, minimum disruption to their existing processes. I mean, that's rational, right? That, that's what you would expect. Um, if any of you were asked to write rules for yourself, you would do the same. Um, so I think there's the challenge here for regulators or commission to um, provide that challenge function and 
um, you know, force a little bit of ambition onto the platforms to really just get a little bit uncomfortable and keep a focus on the on the outcomes. And for regulators, I think there's a challenge too, which we have to recognize, which is that, you know, we don't want to be captured just because we're co-developing regulation with the people who are regulating. Um, not only that, but we it's really important that we're not perceived to be captured either, because I think trust in the system is absolutely crucial um, for its sustainability. There's so much in that. Thank you, Camilla. I definitely want to talk about trust in a little bit, but before I do that, I wanted to call out uh, Peter's comment that we um, still are learning so much more over time about what kinds of data we need to, to uh, get out of this ecosystem in order to have an understanding and plug for our third panel, um, which will feature the Integrity Institute along with the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, Trust and Safety Professional Associations, and Check by Ads. I'm sure there will be some commentary in that about what kinds of data we want in order to get a good understanding of these systems and the dynamics in them. Um, I really like your uh, reference to law as increasingly a framework rather than a series of check boxes. There's an obvious tension there. We like the idea of law as a series of check boxes so that we know what we need to do in order to reach that compliance point. But um, contrasted with the difficulty, complexity, and ever evolving nature of the problems that we're talking about with content and internet governance, I think your sort of comment that we're in the midst of a paradigm shift towards a shared responsibility amongst everyone in this ecosystem. I think that's spot on. And I think that there will forever be a, a component of responsibility for reaching good outcomes for everyone, everyone participating in this. Um, and, and that's just a really interesting way of thinking about this. Um, Travis, we're talking about experiments. You referred to the many different experiments with multi-stakeholder processes that NTIA has done, many of which you yourself have participated in. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about your experiences with these um, different uh, experiments. It seems like a harsh word, but I'm trying to make it scientific, right? It's an experiment. We have a hypothesis we learn in the act of doing. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on those and how they've gone. And, and while we're on this point of sort of shared responsibility, how do you feel like they've sort of uh, worked at building this sense of shared responsibility that we have in addressing these problems? Uh, it's a great question and uh, leads well from uh, from the conversation that was just had. Um, and what I would what I would hammer home with this, right, is incentives, right? Like, what are the incentives? And I think that that's you know the part of the question of like uh, compliance versus um, you know cultural change. Uh, you know, um, are you just simply you know? Uh, even with a compliance, a regulatory compliance regime, ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to build in disincentives or bad behavior, right? And ultimately what you're trying to, you cannot, you cannot have insight into every company and every individual's action at all times. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to build a, a negative disincentive structure for, for better behavior. Um, uh, and they're, you know, looking at these types of models as trying to create of uh, better forms of, um, of buy-in, right? Better forms of inculcating and bringing along these companies to actually do the right thing themselves, right? And, you know, then there's hammers and there's, you know, there's, and there's carrots, right? Um, uh, in that kind of, in that kind of process. Um, and that's kind of like the bigger picture kind of question, but then in terms of the actual processes themselves, again, it's a question of, what are what are the incentives? And one thing that I'd like to call out with this um, is that kind of multi-stakeholder model is not just companies, right? Uh, for it to be a trusted process, for there to be that kind of legitimacy, there are other stakeholders who do get involved and who you would want to involve. But, but it depends on the topic. On cybersecurity, we had a range of stakeholders that were companies, but then also cybersecurity researchers uh, and uh, you know smaller companies and uh, and uh, and you know technical experts, uh, things like that. Whereas with privacy, we had a lot of civil society engagement. I mean, not to say that we didn't have civil society engagement in cybersecurity, but it was a different different folks in the room. Um, and I'll just put it out there: their engagement is hard to sustain. Right, civil society organizations have limited resources, and they really need to figure out where their bang for the buck is. And you know, and I will say, you know, as a non-regulatory agency, 
Um, our processes were hard for those civil society organizations to kind of really gauge um, because ultimately at the end of the day, we didn't have a big stick to say companies, if you don't do this, this is what's gonna happen. And I think that one thing to keep in mind um, uh, in, this, in this conversation is um, multi-stakeholder processes are hard and they can fail. And what is, what is the default if failure happens, right? And in a lot of the things that we're talking about, the failure is, well, the regulator will step in and regulate, right? Or there will be like, there will be some other form of like conversation. Um, and with multi stakeholder processes that are a bit squishier, right? It's like, you know, with ICANN, maybe the internet stops functioning as well, <laughs> right? We, we see that. Uh, so what is the failure model for, for actually incentivizing good faith participation and then um, and then not just participation, but uh, but sustaining after. And so in terms of our processes, I actually will say that they were a bit of an experiment. So the privacy ones in particular, um, a little bit of background on that, the Obama-era Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights was put out uh, in 2012 that proposed an, an, the FTC to have authority over an ambiguous set of principles that they could re enforce against, but then you had the safety valve of, of companies being able to put together codes of conduct that they adhered to. Uh, and that you had a, 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 a rapid, you know, a, a, a you know, fast lane to approval by the FTC uh, for these codes of conduct if you did it in a multi-stakeholder manner. That then got uh, drafted into a, a 2015 bill the, um, uh, to put that into place that never got passed. And we tried to do the military stakeholder processes regardless. We wanted to prove that the model could work. And the thing is, is that we actually did, each one of our multi-stakeholder models on privacy did produce uh, a set of best practices. However, in terms of saying that there was sustained effort afterwards, that, there, that those things led to transformational change of any single one of those areas, I'm not sure you can say that. Right, I think that they were impactful at the time, but particularly on facial recognition technology, like we've moved beyond that as a policy conversation. I can't, and I wish I could say that that's because of our process, but I don't know if we can, particularly since civil society walked out halfway through. And so, um, so the thing is, is that not to say that that means that that's not worth trying, but it's saying it's worth saying that we, you need to look at what the incentive structure is, not just simply for participation in the process and good faith participation in the process, like getting everybody to come in the room, hold hands and jump together, right, which I think is a lot of what, what, what these kinds of things are, um, but to actually then take it and move forward and have that become a sustained living thing. Could I make a comment on that? Please do. This, this, this very important point you're raising here. And it's actually surprising that, that self-regulation is not a formal instrument, at least within the European Union. You see, we struggle exactly with the same thing. I mean, it's something which actually doesn't exist. So we have regulations, we have directives, we have recommendations, all beautiful instruments. Self-regulation, or however, whatever name you want to give it, doesn't exist. So you... And then you struggle with the issue of maybe it's easy to get to get it, but sustaining it and, and making it sort of as a, uh, I'm not sure how I should say that, but as, as a self-regulation on the book, you know, which shouldn't be, obviously. But so I think we don't have the right legal instruments even for, for taking that forward, that concept. And, and I will say that I, I want to point out that there are self-regulatory models in the United States where there are, where they are living things, right, where there are uh, where there are organizations that do maintain codes of practice and do, uh, you know, um, uh, have punishments for individuals in the FTC Section 5 authority against unfair and deceptive practices is a huge component of that. If the company says that they're going to do something and they don't, that's, that is the stick that we have for the most part in the space in the United States. Um, uh, so I don't want to, you know, uh, say that the my experience with the privacy multi-stakeholder processes is universal, but just simply that there are absolutely lessons to be learned from that. I think that's a really important point to draw out this idea that there are some self-regulatory practices that do help. Um, Eli Lehrer from R Street is fond of looking at the, um, the MPAA's rating system, right? In a space where there would be so many obstacles to setting laws that regulate content rating, at least in the United States context, we have we saw the emergence of that as something that I think very usefully provides signals to the public 
um, in, in a way that doesn't require a, a, a regulatory backstop. I'm fond, by the way, of using the metaphor of the sort of Damocles for that sort of pending prospect of regulation that can hide behind a voluntary entry point process to try to get to a better outcome, um, just in case you don't already use the sort, maybe easier for me to use the sort of Damocles than for you. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to jump in, Camille, before I, I shift? Okay, awesome. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, this is a little bit of a detour, but I think it's a really critical point to talk about in this context. I want to talk about the trust gap. I think there's an incredibly big trust gap now amongst all these stakeholders. And so as we talk about the importance and the value of bringing diverse perspectives into these voices, um, it's hard to do that now. So many of you who have talked to me about issues in the space know I'm fond of uh, talking about the word algorithm. I'm a former computer scientist. I taught introduction to algorithms twice. Um, and that word algorithm sure has taken on a new meaning over the past few years. Uh, algorithm is often used as a substitute for magic or even black magic. It's something that we don't understand, we can't control, we just don't know what to do with. And that really sets us back at, at building collaborations and good processes in the space. Um, the other part of my spiel here is that decades ago, computer was used in the same way, right? We saw so many people use the word computer as a synonym for just this powerful force that they couldn't understand. And we, we closed that gap over time. Um, we had a better baseline of trust then. We had a better baseline of trust, I think, amongst stakeholders a while ago to have more um, in-depth conversations, to, to trust industry expertise when it comes in and articulates these things as part of the process of policy development. Is this trust gap something that each of the three of you sort of perceive regularly in your work? And do you have any thoughts about how we can work to tighten it up a little bit better? Um, so yes, trust. Um, there is a trust gap. It's mutual. It's totally understandable, I think, and entirely predictable and expected. And I think that um, if we think about, uh, you know, obviously users and civil society groups and uh, researchers have had frustrations with platforms, so you can understand where the lack of trust comes from. Um, so have regulators. Uh, but let's take it from start from the platform's perspective. I think um, I say it's mutual. They've never really been regulated in the way that we're talking about regulating them now. They've had, some of them have had relationships with competition regulators. Those relationships are almost by definition antagonistic, right? That's the, that's the nature of competition regulation. It's a sort of mostly ex post. So marking your homework, um, usually finding that you've broken a rule and slapping a massive fine. Um, or they've had uh, some interactions with data protection privacy regulators where it's really just about compliance in the sense that they're, they're unlikely to interact with those regulators unless they're being investigated for a breach of the relevant laws. Um, so that's not what we're talking about here as we've just been discussing, right? What the expectations are is for a sort of a different kind of relationship, uh, co-creating a little bit, co-sharing responsibility, um, and that's going to require, I think, a significant shift of mindset in platforms, and that's going to take time, but that's necessary. I should say that it's not just on them, right? I think it's on all of us as well. So from the perspective of a regulator, like I said before, we're, you know, our experience comes from setting rules, monitoring compliance, issuing fines, etc. We are undergoing a bit of a culture change too. We're we're conscious of the fact that we have to live with the fact that um, there is a uh, large, sustained, and probably permanent uh, information asymmetry between us and the organizations that we're going to be regulating, and that uh, it's impossible for us to carry on the way we have always done, and we have to work jointly. So we're going to need the platforms around the table um, all the time, I think. Um, and that's going to be critical if if our guidance, our codes, any enforcement action that we take is to be effective, but also proportionate. So here I'd say some people are scared of regulators. They think that we just are addicted to regulation. Actually, regulators don't really want to regulate unless it's absolutely necessary. Most of us have some form of 
either statutory obligation or commitment to be proportionate in our interventions and also to promote innovation as part of our kind of overall statutory purposes. So if we're to do that, we're going to need, you know, to have a different kind of relationship with the people we're regulating. Um, and I think recognizing that this is a challenge for all of us. So uh, for all of the multi stakeholder groups that have been frustrated with with uh, platforms uh, for regulators, and for the platforms, I think we sort of owe it to each other to recognize and acknowledge that and it will take time. Um, over time, it's basically like a personal relationship. You meet someone the first time, you trust them a little bit, you meet them a second time, you trust them a little bit more. And it's going to be through that sort of iterative dialogue that things will sort of build, I hope. Um, ideally, we'll move from a situation where it's basically us versus them to a situation where it's all of us versus the problem or all of us working towards a shared vision of a safer internet. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, just simply uh, my first observation, and this is totally not normative, it's just an observation. When I heard that question, I did not think about trust between the government and the, and the companies. I try to, I, I, my go-to was the trust of uh, the users to the company. I just think it, it's really interesting um, because that the trust of the platforms and the government and the regulators to each other is, of course, a, a really important component. Um, but my first thought was that, you know, in terms of trust gap, is that there's a huge lack of trust with from the users. And um, in thinking about it the, the way you formulated it, there's probably also a pretty big lack of trust between users and the government in terms of their ability to handle these things and and actually get things done. And <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah, things kind of suck sometimes online. There's reasons for like some stuff is really bad and there are bad things. And there's reason for people to be cynical and to look at things as, as potentially continuing the way that it does. And um, and so, and and the thing is, is that, you know, I think that there's there's some degree of grappling with that and there's some degree of that never going away, right? I mean, we're not, we aren't going to get, we've, We've had we've had the post for a lot longer, and bad stuff still happens. Get to, you know you get bad letters through the. I, mean, I still get um, spam mail, spam mail for my mom <laughs> at my address. You know, so bad stuff still happens. But uh, in terms of like what you were talking about, I, I think it's a fascinating question about trust with with respect to algorithms because it's a it's a um, it's a cat and mouse game, right? Of transparency. Um, versus uh, versus um, versus um, opacity, where uh, you would want uh, algorithmic decisions or decisions that are being made, particularly those that affect people's lives in very real ways, um, be it just simply their livelihood in terms of being content producers, or you know, in terms of like actual like other types of things like credit reporting, things like that. However, the more transparent a system is in how it makes decisions, the more it can be gamed. Right, and so there is an inherent tension to these kinds of questions around how how these how these types of things work, where it they can never be truly transparent, and uh, and that 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 is something that that you know can be explained right in different situations with different risk. You can better explain why there is transparency, why you have certain decisions are being made and certain others and uh, and what the inputs are and things like that, and others where it's really you can't and the more you do the more you let go of some of like what the hashes are for particular like bad content that is being filtered out the more bad people can kind of like alter a little bit of that that hash and like and get that bad content out anyway and so and so there is so i think that with with the algorithmic conversation there is that question of like how much of a black box is it and why and that plays a huge role into into the transparency question unfortunately it's not just to users but then that also has, has a role to play with um with governments and other companies uh, when it comes to trade secrets things like that i think it's really important to call out that these sort of transparency trade-offs and trust gaps really do abound and, and also that our goal shouldn't be to remove them or to close them all because frankly that's impossible um, Peter, I'd love to hear a little bit of your perspective as a delegate from the European Union here on, on these matters. Yeah, the trust conversation. I, I'm still puzzled that with, uh, and I think John in his introduction, he spoke about, uh, he gave numbers about users and having problems with some of these platforms. 
I'm still amazed that if 80% of the citizens or consumers have an issue, that they still use it. Why do they use it? I mean, if if 80% of the people kind of don't like their car, I think some would ditch it, you know, and kind of get another one. So so I think we 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 live a bit in a still kumbaya world where yeah, trust, yeah, very important, nothing happens kind of situation. Uh, I, I, th I think first, trust can only exist between people, human beings, not with a company. A company is just a hypothetical construct of an organizational model to derive a benefit for society, or I don't know whatever definition there exists for such a thing. So it's, it's not a human being, it's not a person. You cannot do anything to a company. You can only do things to people. Uh, I realized that companies employ people. So, and these people are citizens and consumers and I get all of that. But I think we should be also a bit realistic that uh, I think to get things right, we need to take action, real action and, and, and move the things. And if something is not right, no problem in trying it. There's nothing wrong. We have been talking about experimentation. I'm not suggesting that we should experiment with society or economy, but if we want to move forward and get anywhere near of this digitization we all have in mind and all chasing, we, we get up, you know, we have to be real experimenters. We have to get stuff. And, and this means dissecting the animals, you know, killing animals and I don't know, whatever you do in order to get to the gist of it. So I think we are far away from really understanding the trust question. We're dancing around with it. We understand it maybe, but the willingness to take action is still fairly low, also in the EU, I mean, obviously. I think that makes a lot of sense. I like your reference point to um, to trust really being grounded in in people. I think it's it's hard to to uh, it's not just for, for corporations, it's for governments as well. Anyway, just again, I'm thankful for the three of you being up here as individuals who I've had so many good conversations with, who, who I feel like I have a good trust relationship with at least. Um, Totally new question for you. Uh, in in the vein of maybe maybe countries aren't quite um, constructs in the same way that companies are, but the internet is global. We've referred to that a few points in time. Local laws are national, regional, local in their own way. Um, would working across stakeholder groups across borders be a more effective or an easier way to deal with what are sensibly global problems? Camila, I think you spoke to this a little bit in, in some of your earlier remarks, um, but but let me drill in a little bit more specifically. Would working with established structures like the G7 or some of the ad hoc gatherings that we've seen crop up in recent years, like the Paris Peace Forum or the Christchurch Call, um, for anyone not familiar with those, you can do some do some searching later and, and find they're really they're really worth reading about. Um, there's a lot uh, sort of more energy I see in international governmental collaborations. Sometimes they're multilateral processes, which is a technical term that means really only governments in the room. Sometimes they're more multi-stakeholder and involve other non-governmental stakeholders in the table. What's your take on these and on these as ways of sort of tackling with these really broad, rich, complex problems? I'll, I'll, I'll take this one first and just simply say, I mean, I. Uh, that is not one of my key roles in terms of in terms of what I'm working on. So please, grains of salt with what I'm saying here. Um, but just simply to say, uh, I think that there's absolute value uh, in that type of engagement. Uh, like was said here, like the internet doesn't have clear cut borders. I mean, when we're talking about engaging with stakeholders, if you're talking about companies um, that are online you're kind of talking about international companies, right? Like it, it, there's very few uh, online companies with any like sustained presence that I would say, you know, are necessarily um, uh, truly um, local. Um, and, uh, and certainly um, as we're seeing in a lot of um, these laws and regulations, um, we're starting to see some movement towards uh, extraterritorial scope, right? And, uh, and that causes, that, that can cause some real conflicts, right? And that can cause some real um, hard places for uh, companies and for individuals in terms of what jurisdiction they're in and what, what they're adhering to and, um, and uh, where some things may be legal where they are, but what they are doing, uh, you know, is not legal elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and I think that so in terms of like high level coordination, like that is there's absolutely a ton of value to that, particularly in as much as it can take into account 
um, diverse views uh, from, um, from uh, you know, diverse stakeholders. That being said, you know, we also are all sovereign democratic countries with our own processes and our own histories of law. And so to a certain extent, there is a degree of needing to work together with our approaches being really, really different. And, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, the big sticking point in the United States is we have the First Amendment, and that puts a real hard limit on what the government can do in this space in a lot of different ways. And that's not going to change anytime soon, right? Like that's, the, the, I mean, there might be some changes in, in, in case law and in precedent and in things like that, but a lot of that fundamental stuff isn't going to change. And so we do, I think, these types of engagements, these kinds of uh, conversations are really, really important in terms of like having different backgrounds, having different approaches, and making sure that we can, in fact, still coexist and still work together. Because again, but pulling it back in the other way, we are all democratic societies, and we are all, we share a core set of values that I think that we all, all are, are working towards. Um, and that's, that's kind of saying we, there's, there's some, there's that, that's, that's a little bit of an asterisk there, right? There's a lot of countries who are not, and they are engaged in a lot of these international processes as well, um, not, not necessarily the G7, but they are engaged in some of these processes as well. And, um, and they too need to be engaged, right? In a different way, but they also do need to be engaged. Um, so. So unsurprisingly, as the director of international at Ofcom, <laughs> I think international cooperation is absolutely key here. Um, just at the moment, we've got um, at least two regimes going through birth pains. So the DSA and the online safety bill are emerging. We've got an existing uh, regime for online safety in Australia, which has just recently been revised. We've got the Canadians who are um, proposing some, uh, some new regulations as well. Um, so obviously, I think you make a really good point. Not, you know, some countries have the First Amendment. We're not going to achieve a harmonized single global approach uh, because there are legitimate differences between countries, but we need to ensure that the way that these new frameworks evolve is at least compatible. And why? Why do they need to be compatible? I think firstly, because uh, remind, reminding ourselves that the, the largest companies that we're thinking about are global. They operate across the world. And uh, it's in our interests, I think in, in our mutual interest to look at and think about compliance friction and compliance costs. There's really no reason if there are unwarranted divergences in the regulatory approaches, we should get rid of them, or we should avoid them arising in the first place. So I think a degree of international cooperation at, at this very time when, when the regimes are emerging is, is really important for that. I think also, um, if we ensure compatible regimes, it'll make it easier for us over time as we're implementing them to uh, exchange experiences, and uh, build a more robust sort of body of global best practices, um, which will be, I think, helpful for everyone. I think it will make it easier for, um, you know, assuming we all manage to get robust researcher access provisions in our respective regimes, then it'll be easier for comparative analysis uh, to take place if the regimes themselves are, are comparable or compatible. And then down the line, if we find ourselves having to run investigations or take enforcement action under these frameworks, if they're compatible, then the international cooperation to, to support that will be so much easier. And so I think we have to really sort of think long-term in that sense. And so if we look at where we are now, at the very least, we've got, I think, two genetically related frameworks, the DSA and the Online Safety Bill. Both of them are very much based on this concept of a shared responsibility, as we were mentioning earlier, with risk assessments and the sort of concept of a duty of care. Both of them have put transparency very, very much at the center, um, both for the general public and also for regulators, um, and both recognize the information asymmetries and so anticipate quite robust information gathering powers for regulators. Those are really important, I think, pillars. 
you mentioned the G7 before, and um, the internet principles, I think, are really important. Now, the G7, it's a political body, and the, the, the statement is obviously a very high-level political statement, but, you know, they do um, make recommendations that this space uh, involve a degree of multi-stakeholder engagement. It's important, I think, to have that kind of statement uh, in a G7, uh, in the G7 principles, because I think they set the tone and they, uh, they set the sort of aspiration or expectations that regulators and governments and whoever else is drawing up the rules, uh, they're committed to doing so in collaboration with uh, the wider society, with civil society, with researchers, with charities, with academics, um, and not in a vacuum. And I think that's really, uh, it's a really useful point, I think, to sort of to hold on to. I guess the question then is, okay, well, what is that, um, what is the nature of that multi-stakeholder engagement going to be at the global level? And there are obviously lots of initiatives out there already, um, but I think it's useful probably to maybe classify or, or separate them into two, two broad camps, right? So there's, there's one kind of multi-stakeholder engagement, which can be about building common frameworks around content types or harm types or safety duties um, where I think we've got uh, you know we've got things like Christchurch call for example on certain types of terrorist content I think terrorist content and you know child sexual abuse material are probably the easy cases where you'll have a degree of, of broader agreement then you start getting into the harder cases like hate speech for instance where it will engage some national sensitivities which will vary across the world um, I don't think that's a problem I think for instance in the EU we've We've lived with that, or you, not, so that's sadly no longer us, um, lived with that for many decades in the context of audiovisual regulation, where you've got you know, cultural differences. So that's all fine. But I think the, almost the more important area for multi-stakeholder engagement is not at that level of the sort of content types and harm types, but to support all the stuff I was saying at first about compatibility, it's, it's the regulatory toolkit. It's the, it's the things like um, common framework for transparency metrics, definitions, approaches to risk assessment, how audits will take place, who will carry them out, what they mean, um, researcher access, I mentioned earlier, um, codes of conduct or codes of practice, uh, you know, learnings from the code of practice on disinformation, a code of conduct of disinformation, any, any learnings that might derive from Ofcom's experience. I think um, there's quite a lot to do there. Um, and there's, I think, a real opportunity for multi-stakeholder fora, both the ones that already exist and the new ones that might come to be to, to really become reference points, I think, and, and sort of tie themselves into the various national uh, emerging regimes. There's very little to add because I think you have very eloquently explained that. I, I'm an engineer, so I have to structure things. You know, when you talk, I see boxes popping up and these sort of things. So um, I, I, th I think you, you spoke very well about that, what I call a middle layer, which is compatible frameworks. Um, I, th I think first, there's a layer above it, which are principles and Western world principles are probably the ones governing us. This is where G7 comes in. This is, I think, where from a European perspective, we would take a little bit our work mandate. You know, if G7 repeatedly talks about something, decides about something, we read it there, the European Commission would start reflecting where there's a need for action. And that need for action in most cases would lead to frameworks. I mean, we rarely, and I think we said earlier, we rarely make regulations which are really, really specific because by the time the, the ink is dry, it's already outdated. So, so you have to build these clever frameworks, but the problem with frameworks is you have to implement them. So one day, you know, the rubber hits the road, so you have to have implementation rules. And this is where I think very often we, we are not putting in enough work in making those implementation rules interoperable uh, because that makes it hard for the companies. And, and there are many reasons why this doesn't happen. For instance, just different timeframes can be very simple reasons. You know, if one country is not interested to do it now, well, then you know, it's gonna be difficult to, to build compatible systems at the implementation level. And this is where I come back, trying to make the link now, coming back to the, to the multi-stakeholder environment, because I think this is one of the works they could nicely pick up. Because 
you brought the example of Digital Services Act, surely beautiful, but needs a lot of implementation work now. And all that implementation work, we will happily do it. But this is where I think we can make small mistakes, which can have big consequences for companies around the world. We don't want to do that, but who's going to help us? Surely the companies. Yeah, but you know, I think there are a couple of other actors around the world where I think you would like to interoperate and see kind of, you know, can we, can we build something which actually works? And if it works for Europe, it probably works for many parts. So at least 80% of it will work for many of the Western world parts as well. So I, I'm not suggesting we, we have a copyright on that, but, but it's kind of, you know, the one first, the first one will kind of have to do that work. Thank you all. I also uh, think about these things in structures as you do, Peter, and I'm imagining this really nice sort of framework of a shared set of international principles such as the G7s and others and really approaching at the highest level of abstraction, something that we can all sign on to. And then at the bottom, we have these sort of questions that we don't know to ask yet and the answers to those questions that we don't have for which we obviously have a lot of work to do and I think we'll be also talking about that later in the course of this event today and in the middle this aspirational layer of uh, what we would like to see as compatible frameworks that are emerging so you know just tell your governments just try to figure out how to make them all <laughs> compatible so that we can work and make this this uh, structure work out as nice as we can we have a couple minutes left until our break and i know i'm standing in between the people in this room and coffee and cookies uh, but i'd love to give everyone a ch in this panel a chance to say 30 seconds worth of final closing thoughts or it can be a choose your own adventure if you'd like i can give you another provocation um what do you want to hear from the panels later today particularly the one for from our sort of non-governmental uh, institutions and groups like the Integrity Institute, my co-hosts that are coming up, what do you wanna hear coming from them to make your jobs a little bit easier because you certainly do not have the resources that you would like to tackle the, tackle the complexities of these problems before you. So choose your own adventure that or general closing thoughts. Let's go in reverse order, Peter, back to Travis, thanks. I've been so negative. I have the feeling the last 60 minutes, so I want to say something positive at the very end. Uh, and and which comes from the bottom of my heart, I have to say, you know, the last few years, the last two years was such a pleasure working in the United States because I have seen such a dynamism here. I mean, whether it's the identification of issues or people working on it, whether this is outside government or inside government, it's, it's tremendous the energy you feel these days here in Washington. Uh, maybe I, my, my bar was very low, you know, that could well be. But still, I think right now we are at a really good time where a lot can happen in a short period of time because all the groundwork has been done. Now the question is, are the pieces of the mosaic coming together with the speed I would like to see it? Well, I think uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. So I've, um... I'm just very pleased to be here in person today and meeting some of the people that um, I'd met online over the last few years. Those conversations that I had, um, that will, a group of us had, we've been actually having quite a few over the last couple of years in the international team and meeting people from a number of different organizations, many of which are represented here today. And after each one, it's been like a complete sort of boost of energy um, sort of jumping around thinking, ah, oh, there's so much to do. There's so, so much, you know, I've just learned so much in the last hour. So I want to continue that. So I would like, um, you know, the groups that we've met so far and the ones we haven't met yet to reach out. If, if we haven't reached out to you, reach out to us. Um, we're, we're hungry, really, to, to learn from other people. Um, we know that we don't know all the questions we need to ask. Um, so we're, we're definitely uh, open for, uh, you know, being, having our gaps filled, basically, and, and working closely together over the very exciting next few years for us, certainly trying to make sense of the new bill that was published last week and putting together, um, you know, a number of codes of conduct that will try to make the internet a better place. So very much looking forward to working with uh, as many of you as possible. And let me just add briefly, if you have any trouble finding Camilla or Ofcom or the folk to talk to, your hosts at R Street would be happy to help be a bridge for you and help facilitate some of these connections and communications. Travis. Uh, sure. Um, I think that what I would say is uh, there's two questions. 
or one question and then a whole slew of questions, which is, you know, ultimately we're all looking at what is the internet that we're looking for, right? What, what is the internet that we're trying to get towards? Um, but then you break it down and it's really like, again, I would really emphasize the context specificity and like, what are the actual goals of these processes, of these rules as, you know, in as much as there are actual achievable, like actualizable goals that, um, that can then be tackled? Like what are, I mean, I know that it's hard to anticipate all the questions, but, but to a certain extent, we do need to really have a full articulation of, um, of what, what we want to do um, that, you know, isn't like, you know, to, to the R Street, you know, opening, right, isn't getting rid of bad things on the internet, because that's not, not possible, right? So what are those actualizable goals? How do we, how do we then go about them? And in terms of like these individual processes and things, like how do we then define that, bring in the right people to actually um, move it forward and get the incentive structures in place? Thank you very much. And if you could thank me, uh, join me in thanking our speakers. Thanks for the thoughtful and, and productive content. Okay, 15 minutes, coffee, cookies, and chatting, and then we will have our second panel beginning up here. Thank you very much.